Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm sure we're still gonna have a, a few stragglers coming in. Uh, next up is Bardia Vahidi. Uh, Dr. Vahidi is a registered environmental assessor of the state of California and a lead auditor of uh, ISO 9001, OSAS 18001, ISO 14001, RIAS, and R2. <laughs> All five standards. Um, and he's been uh, cooperating uh, with Perry Johnson's registrar since 2011. He holds a BS in Natural Resource Engineering, a Master's in Environmental Management, and a PhD in Engineering Management. He has more than 15 years of consulting and auditing experience in oil, gas, petrochemical, power and energy construction, electronics, and recycling industries. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, this afternoon we're gonna go uh, through a certification process and uh, what are the you know, stages you have to be you know, considered. Uh, for certification, uh, we have two stages. Uh, usually, you know, we ask what is the stage one and uh, stage two and also your certification, certification audit and recertification. So we're gonna go through it, you know, step by step and also uh, we're going to talk about the integrated management system. Also, you know, we're going to give you some, you know, helpful hint uh, to how you, you know, choose your, you know, register, what you have to be careful, and also uh, top finding during, you know, uh, our audit. And online resources for from PGR, you can have access and, you know, webinars and, you know, training. Okay. Okay, the initial audit consists of two stages. A stage one, uh, okay, during the stage one, we have opening and closing meeting. And uh, we go through your, you know, we do, you know, on-site uh, document review of your uh, QEHS, you know, system. What do you have in place? And uh, we go through, you know, your procedures, uh, uh, forms, and uh, to see you already know implement your system. Also, uh, we want to see uh, you have the you know manual or you know you you did you know all of the you know elements of the standards before uh, moving to a stage two. Uh, during the stage one, we have uh, concern and nonconformities. For your concern, you don't have to do anything. For your concern, just it's a, you know maybe it's going to be a potential for your. Uh, stage to audit. And for nonconformities, just you have to send, you know, a PJR your uh, evidence. After stage one, uh, you ha usually you have, you know, 60 days to submit your, you know, evidence to your auditor, but it, you know, we think it's better, you know, sometimes, you know, I see some clients uh, schedule their stage to one month. So in this case, just you have to keep in mind, you have to, you know, submit the document, you know, after two or three weeks. A stage two audit a scheduling, you know, usually you know, we have a stage two, 30 to 75 days after stage one audit. During, we have, again, we have an opening and closing meeting. And uh, audit days usually based on your you know, scope, uh, processes, and you know, number of employees you have. Uh, during the stage two, we go more detail. We go, you know, check all of your, you know, uh, processes. We want to see you have, uh, you complete, you know, and implemented all the requirements. Non-compromises uh, for a stage, during uh, a stage, for a stage two, we have uh, OFI, opportunity for improvement. We have observations. And uh, also, we do have uh, non-conformities. Non for non-conformities, we have minor and major. Major, you know, usually use it, you know, when you have, you know, something, you know, you forgot, you know, to implement something about your, you know, elements of a standards, or uh, it was a, you know, previous, you know, non-conformity, and you didn't fix it right. 
And uh, for minors, you have, again, you know, 60 days to submit it to your auditor. And just you have to keep in mind you know, your certification before you get in, you have to submit it and get an approval from executive committee of the you know, PJR before submit it uh, uh, to get your certification. So you have to uh, make sure you submit it right time. Okay, and surveillance audit. Surveillance audit is scheduled, you know, it depends on your number of your employees. Uh, usually, you know, we schedule it uh, after, you know, uh, 60 uh, 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 semi-annually or annually. Uh, it depends on number of employees and process. And usually, you know, uh, we can do it, you know, for your surveillance audit uh, after three, uh, uh, we can you ask for you know one or two auditors depends on the you know how many mandates you need, and uh, we can do it. Also, we can do it you know partial system audit for you. Sometimes you know uh, you have uh, nine thousand or like you know fourteen thousand and uh, fourteen thousand one or uh, R two. So in this case, we can do all together. And recertification audit is you know usually you know after you know third year of your certification. We come and go check all of your, you know, uh, system. We go through all of your documentation and everything, and uh, we uh, recommend you for the new certification as an auditor. Again, executive committee go through all of your documentation, and uh, they want to make sure you have everything in place, and you re, uh, uh, re uh, uh, they give you, you know, new certification. And again, for the you know, next three years, you have your certification. Okay, as you know, Rios follows the plan, do, check, act model. We call it as a PDCA or, you know, Deming uh, cycle. It's exactly the same as, you know, other system, like, you know, 14,000 and uh, R2. That's why we, you know, recommend if you want it, you can do it, you know, if you have a 14,000 in place at the moment or you have R2 in place, so we can, you know, integrate it and, you know, merge all of them together. Integrated, uh, uh, integrated audit helps to reduce overall cost, definitely, because when you go through the audit based on the time we have, we go through all of your, for example, legal and other requirements one time. Go through your monitoring and measurement one time or operational control. So in this case, you have a, uh, you know, you can, you know, minimize your cost. Okay, next is that, just I want to give you, you know, some hints about, you know, most, you know, NCs we see, or we call it as the NCRs during our audit. Operational control. You know, when we, you know, conducting audit, we see, you know, some hazard, hazard waste and universal waste regulation have not been considered or not been implemented effectively like for your environmental aspects or your, you know, your hazard identification. Uh, again, as a sample, I can say a lack of, you know, label or, you know, incorrect labeling on product. So you don't have a labeling process. I, when, you know, conducting in the sidewalk, I see in some places uh, they, have, they don't have a quarantine, you know, quarantine area or they forgot to put the label on the you know, chemicals or, you know, flammable cabinets. So you just you have to be careful when you want to do labeling system, your entire system uh, cover. Uh, another thing, you know, about the uh, NCR, previous NCRs, usually when we go through your cards and uh, NCs from previous audit, uh, we will see uh, you don't have proper, you know, corrective actions and mostly because you don't have any proper uh, root causes or you didn't have a, you know, you evaluate your root causes for your previous audit. Usually I'm pretty sure you're familiar with five why systems. So you have to just keep asking why, why, why to uh, find out what was the problem. For example, if I, I don't know, is anyone, you know, familiar with five why system to define uh, root causes? I'll give you an example. For uh, example, for operational control, 
uh, I can see you have a shredder, but uh, you don't have environmental aspects and hazard identification for it. Just we can say, you know, we usually on our finding, we say uh, operational control was not conducted effectively. So you have to go and do the car and re-evaluate your system. So sometimes they said, okay, now we have a procedure for it. But it's not enough, it's not, not the root cause. For root cause, you have to go more detail. You say, why you don't have it? Maybe, you know, you can, <coughs> sometimes, you know, root cause, the best root cause you can find is because of trade. You didn't have a sufficient training for it. You can find, you know, all the information about the how, you know, these findings on uh, PJR website. We do have a, you know, pretty good webinar, and you can go through it and check for how you have to, you know, find the root causes and everything. And the other one in document and record keeping controls. Again, you have, I know, I'm pretty sure, you know, lots of, the, you have lots of document and you have to keep track of everything. But, you know, you will see you have for, uh, update your revision dates or, you know, update your, you know, documentation number, but you don't update your matrix or index of your document and procedure. So it's better, you know, to have the complete documentation system in place and you review it. Another thing, training. Uh, usually when we go check your training and competency, we will see uh, you don't have, or you know, some other, you know, uh, companies they don't have enough uh, training because they, like they didn't define their training needs properly. Do you know how you have to define, for example, training needs? What are the inputs to your training? Anyone can? For the training. How you, how you, you have to define your training. These are the, you know, some things, again, you can, you know, check it on, you know, uh, with your, I don't know if you implemented yourself or asking your consultant. When you want to define your training, you have to check and make sure you comply with your legal and other requirements. Legal and record requirement is one of the best key. The other one, it could be, you know, environmental aspects and hazard identification. Third one, incident or accident. So these are help you to define your training. So that's why when we go through and check training record or training uh, uh, topics, we, they are not usually, you know, complete. Other one about the supplier operational control and uh, process of approving suppliers or we call it as a downstream vendors or contractors. Again, just you have to make sure you have a system in place. We don't, we, we want to see you have a system for, you know, how to select your vendors. What are the questionnaires you send there? What are the license and certifications you have? Other one for, other, you know, about identifying the QAHS, uh, QAHS uh, footprint, or they call it, you know, as a hazard identification or, you know, environmental impact assessment. Sometimes you forgot about, you know, legal and other requirements. Sometimes, you know, incomplete, you know, EHS. We are, there are, you know, so many different uh, ways and methodology to uh, choose uh, for uh, environmental assessment or hazard identification. So it's up to you to choose the, you know, correct one, but just you have to make sure. We can see, you know, some, you know, like, you know, lack of stormwater, no exposure certification or stormwater permits. So just you have to make sure you contact your uh, agencies and interested parties to get all the proper information. Another one, like, you know, MSDS. You don't have some, you know, uh, all MSDSs. During audit, you know, it starts in some, so many places. They have, you know, paints, but they don't have an MSDS for their paints. They have, you know, flammable cabinets, but inside the flammable cabinets, they don't have all the MSDSs. So just you have to make sure and you have to have a system again to make sure before buy anything or you know bring it to your facility you have all the MSDSs. Uh, another item is regarding emergency preparedness, incomplete emergency preparedness and response plan. And again, 
I see, you know, some uh, audit, uh, they forgot to add, you know, emergency si situations, identification based on their location. Uh, you have to consider, you know, natural disaster. Sometimes in some places, you know, robbery or, you know, breaking it. These, these are, you know, different, you know, situations and depends on the different locations, but you have to have it under control. And another thing, when you define your emergency response situation, you have to make sure uh, you have all the training and like, you know, drills for it. And just, you know, monitor it and reevaluate it. Improving planning about, you know, objectives, uh, I can say objectives are not quantity. Uh, measurable and quantifiable. Uh, when you want to define your objectives and targets, you have to be, you know, be sh uh, make sure when we want to define our objectives and targets, they have to be, or they should be a smart. A smart means it must be a specific, uh, measurable, achievable, timetable, and recordable. So when you want it to define your objectives and targets, target, make sure you can, you know, measure them. Okay, so before going for uh, Q&A, just if you want, just keep in mind, if you want to choose your, you know, register, it's better, you know, or even your consultant is better to, you know, do the due diligence before it and ask for some references to make sure you have the, all the proper, you know, documentation and, uh, Another thing, I th if when you want to schedule for the audit, I don't know if you have a consultant or you know you implement it yourself. Keep in mind, usually it takes you know one month to schedule you for you know audit, sometimes two, uh, because we have to you know go through your initial documentation and you know schedule the audit. So as soon as you uh, apply for certification, it's better. Okay, so if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Sure. Um, I know it's about the audit and okay. not the recycling. Okay. Is it hard for me to get certified in 12 in the same location or you get out of separate? You have to do it, you know, we, we have to add your two locations inside your certification. We can go through it, and but we have to, you know, combine all of them. Uh, you know, add, we're going to add it to your scope. So could you section off a part of your facility property just strictly for electronics recycling and only have that operate by your IMS and get certified? I'm sorry. So if you, if you have one piece of property, one address, mm -hmm. and half that site is designated scrap and the other half is designated electronics and your employees who do electronics only work on the electronics side and your employees who work <coughs> in scrap only work in the scrap side. Can you only have your integrated management system and your certification apply to the electronic side? If you, you know, just if you use all of them, you know, you exchanging employees between the two, you have to just, you make sure you have the, all the proper documentation, training records for, you know, both. Okay. Paula, yep. do you know the answer to that? Yeah. So, uh, so the question is, there's a mic right there. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is from mm -hmm. yeah. from scope <laughs> is uh, on the scope perspective. Can I certify a certain operation? From, can I minimize my scope? Does it have to be the entire facility? So, if you have, you can ask ask for the uh, you know exclusion. So that part is not going to be under your scope. For R2, if you want for the, you know, uh, that we are talking about Rios at the moment, but for the R2, uh, you can do it. Uh, I'm sorry. For 2000 uh, Division R2. Maybe, maybe not. 
Paula, if you can. No, I think what they're referencing is that they're requiring now the EHS component, which is what Rio Springs uses, right? Because you have to have a. Right, the, so the EHS component. requires the EHS, and that's. The that's the correct. That's what they're referencing. Component under R2. That's correct. Because we have, we have three buildings in a row. We have two dedicated to scrap metal, and our third building is, is a different, is uh, the electronics recycling. So I'm thinking we can get R2 a lot more rapidly than we can Rio to the whole plan. And we're working on both right now. Mm -hmm. But we re recently lost a contract because we weren't R2 cer certified. So if I could get R2 certified more rapidly and work on Rio later, that would be to my benefit. So, um, Corey talked about it before, the changes coming. No, you're fine, you're fine. Uh, talked about the changes coming with, with the R2 uh, standard. So they're hoping to have final board approval by uh, June, June of 2013, um, which would require all sites to be certified to the new standard by December of 2014. So if you go and you get certified now to R2 2008, you're going to have to get recertified, if I'm correct, to the 2013 version. So that's not just a surveillance audit, it's full certification. Um, so there will be some additional costs if you, if you do 2008 now and, and then 2013 in a year. To answer her question a little bit also, uh, we have non-electronics recycling going on in certain of our facilities as well as electronics. And in our R2 scope, we exclude certain things that are non-electronic, such as appliances or other types of recycling, metals recycling. So in the R2 scope, you can exclude, you know, and should exclude, non-electronics. It doesn't belong in that scope. So you can definitely have excluded from your R2 scope non-electronics. Well, we're going for both. I just wanted to make yeah. sure I It's not a focus material under R2. Oh. <laughs> so. That's how I just wanted to get all No, it's not a. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna hear on the supply chain end of the business, uh, and we're gonna hear from Mike Watson for Dell. Uh, Mike serves as the Director of Compliance for Dell Asset Recovery and Recycling. In this role, Mr. Watson leads the development and implementation of Dell's global recycling policies and procedures, including any regulatory interpretation, service planning, vendor auditing, information systems implementation, He's also responsible for ensuring Dell's compliance with any federal, state, and local environmental regulations as they relate to computer recycling and reuse across Dell America's operations. During his 17-year Dell tenure, Mr. Watson has also served in, general, in several other leadership roles, including Senior Manager for Global E-Commerce, Senior IT Operations Manager for Global Sales, Global Program Director for Corporate Finance, and IT Senior Manager for Global Finance. Prior to that, he spent nine years as the IT Director at Media Techs Communications, the parent company of Texas Monthly. Mr. Watson attended Kent State University and the University of Texas at Austin, so please welcome Mike Watson for Dell Computers. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, folks, for, for your time today. I appreciate it. Um, my goal today is to dispel any rumor that OEMs actually make money on this. Uh, I heard that earlier today, and I want to make sure that I land this point, um, that OEMs spend a tremendous amount of money on this. We've never been able to turn this into a profit center. Our goal is just to spend 
to optimize the spend in this space, and you'll, you'll see why as we go along here. So um, we look at our operations very, very globally. We have one corporate policy on the electronics disposition. We have one corporate policy on data destruction in our return streams. Um, we have um, global operations. So we have 70 recyclers around the world that uh, work on our behalf to properly meet our corporate policies and our public commitments to our customers on what is the pro how first we define what is responsible recycling and then we our, our goal is flawless execution through those 70 partner channels to make sure that this works properly so a global process to make that happen um, uh, so the execution is on large scale, and you'll see we're talking about hundreds of millions of pounds of material coming back to us. Me much of that has customer data on it, and much of it has some level of value to it. Um, the, time, or, uh, the age uh, of this material ranges from seven years old with cat hair and fuzz and has been mostly dismantled all the way to uh, buyer's remorse where it's returned to us with the boxes still uh, sealed. Uh, so there's a variety of material that we're handling on an ongoing basis and we have a global operation that handles that in a very consistent way through all 70 of our partners. So global operations is really critical and you'll understand uh, some of our bigger concerns. Um, today, we know of at least five of these standards around the world. Many of you are aware that there's two standards for electronics recycling in the US. Well, you may not be aware that Canada has their own. Australia has their own. Uh, what's interesting is Australia cobbled together uh, some language out of R2, some language out of e-stewardship, some language out of the Canadian standard, and called it their standard. Um, they're actually working, that was their bridge standard, so they're working on a countrywide standard now. Europe has a standard called We Forum, or We Labex, um, designed and developed uh, by uh, we, Lab we Forum, which is a compliance organization across Europe. So there's a wide variety of standards out there. Um, Dell came to the table with a stand, and, and you can see um, this is the list of them. I'll try to speed this along. Um, uh, so those standards, there's five of them. We have to meet all of them, and one of our goals is to drive to some globally consistent standards. So when you go to the Dell site, go to dell.com backslash recycling, and what you're going to find is we built, in advance of all of these standards, our own standards. So we created a standard that is robust, rigorous, and removes risk. Uh, as much risk as possible from Dell and the Dell brand. And I believe Bob <coughs> talked about some of the reasons why people do this. To remove risk is primarily why Dell does this. This is not to get money. This is, it, it is in some ways to re remove some costs from our cost structure, but primarily how do we handle all of our customers' materials in the most responsible way pos possible without drawing risk to the Dell brand. So this slide walks through uh, the offerings that we have in our return streams that end up at those 70 recyclers. So if you look at it as a funnel, it really starts at the top and ends up at the recyclers at the bottom. On the left side of the screen, you're going to see the consumer. The consumer, uh, we have very specific offerings for the consumer. We are also heavily regulated across the world. Uh, there's 73 jurisdictions around the world. It's up to, it's, it's nearly 120 jurisdictions at this point. When I made this slide, uh, it was 73. 120 jurisdictions across the world that say we must, at no cost, take anything with our brand back uh, from our customers when they're done with it. So that's a big part of the volumes that we receive. Um, producer responsibility. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the regulatory. We also have free recycling. Dell was the first in the world to come out with a program that said if you have something with the Dell brand on it, you go to dell.com, uh, just dell.com, and on that first page, at the very bottom, it says recycle your Dell, 
and it takes you right to taking action. We will, we will send somebody to your house and they will pick it up at no cost to you and take it away. Um, again, this isn't for us to make money. This is uh, our customers telling us they wanted something done responsibly, electronically. It was regulators saying nobody's really taking action in this space. So um, I believe Michael, told, Michael Dell told uh, CES two year, three years ago, he had a keynote speech and he told um, the whole industry, we're taking lead in this space and we challenge you all to follow. So uh, the first in the industry to have a free recycling program for anything with the Dell brand on it um, came from Dell. Uh, and then we have for our consumers, we have trade in programs, we have trade up programs, we have donation programs. Um, there was one of our customers mentioned a little while ago on a donation program. Um, the cabin was not ours, but the donation program is part of our deliverables. Um, and then we have retail relationships. So that's all on the consumer side. On the right side of the page is our business offering. So we sell as a business, and that's where we actually make a little bit of money. We sell as a business to commercial customers. When we sell 2,000 new systems to a large customer, we also have that ability to go out and bulldoze whatever's on their desktops today. So that's a commercial offering. It's what I call white gloves. It's a totally special and unique need that commercial customers have. So we have an offering for fee um, and everything that you see on the right side of the page is generally for fee. Um, Europe, and EMEA is Europe, uh, and developing countries typically have some type of obligation for the manufacturers, even on the commercial side, for us to take some responsibility. Either they deliver it to us and we properly dispose of it at no cost. Uh, that's usually the model for a commercial customer. Um, and the ARS service is the for fee service, asset recovery service around the world. We transport it, we do the data destruction, and we turn any of the value found in this equipment, typically it's three-year-old systems, we turn that value back to the customer. Uh, globally consistent offers, that's all on the commercial side. What holds this all together is our public commitments and how we execute to those public commitments. So we had committed to by 2009, uh, deliver 125 million kilograms of material um, diverted from landfill through these programs. We committed that by 2014, you'll see the chart in a minute, by 2014, 454 million kilograms. That translates loosely to a billion pounds. Um, so that's a lot of material that we're moving across the world. And generally, the primary costs for these programs come from our logistics, just moving this stuff around. Um, and our commitment is lowest cost, highest quality industry leadership. And then it's all held together by our export policies. And again, at dell.com backslash recycling, you're gonna see our, our um, electronics disposition policy. Uh, nothing gets exported unless it's functionally tested and not, if it's, if it's functionally tested and working, it can be exported. If it's not functionally tested, there's no export. Um, there's the volumes. You can see we're really moving a lot around. Um, and the far right yellow arrow is last year's final totals. We were very near a billion pounds. Be watching in this space very soon. There will be some fairly substantial uh, announcements around um, our uh, uh, actually reaching our billion pounds in the very near future. Um, but you can see at the beginning, I actually came on board about 2004. Uh, we took in about 10,000 pounds of material the entire year before I got there. Um, so we're at a billion now. Um, so the way we built the programs, the way we defined responsible recycling is really through corporate beliefs. So from the very top, I've, I have quarterly um, status meetings with Michael and his direct reports explaining where we are where we're headed, and why we didn't do what he thinks we should do. Um, that's always a challenging conversation. Um, corporate beliefs. So our environmental guidelines, as I said, Dell.com, backslash recycling, you're going to find it all out there. We're very transparent. Due diligence. We have a very crisp and tight process for how we bring any new environmental partners 
on board. It's a 17 step, step process. It's annoying for most, but it's risk aversion for us. And that's what's most important. We're not really trying to make this an any baby can kind of thing. Uh, contractual partner commitments, they're deep, they're thorough. Uh, at that same site, dell.com backslash recycling, you're gonna find on the far right, the environmental partner standard. And it walks through the insurances, the certifications, um, all of the different things that are required. It's about a 17 page document. Um, and you'll find some very common language between what we wrote in 2004 and what is being taught today. So that's kind of good news. Um, sustained compliance. We have ongoing channel audits. And what that means is once a year, every one of our 70 plus environmental partners goes through an eight to 10 week audit. Um, they must pass or else trucks stop. And second, every month, every physical location that does data destruction on Dell's behalf gets visited by a third party auditor unannounced once a month. And they, they look at nearly a day's worth of production if they can get it all accumulated. So um, the ongoing channel audits are absolutely critical for us. Two minutes? Ten. Ten? Oh, I can slow down. <laughs> all right. Uh, global partner onboarding. So this is how we onboard our partners. The green is done by one third party. So we have two third parties that participate in onboarding our partners. Uh, the green is um, downstream channels environmental health and safety, logistics, data forensics, and security. So one third party does all of those audits. Separately, we have a second third party just to check the auditor doing um, financial, I'm, I'm sorry, doing security and data forensics because the data is the biggest risk in our business. When you're pushing around a billion pounds of material, there's a lot of data. There's a ton of, many ten, tons of data bearing devices in all of that. So data is king in our risk focus. Um, and of course, there's no audit in this space without true due diligence at a down, from the downstream perspective. So we follow this all, we follow this through our partners. And like I said, we have 70 plus environmental partners. We do this once a year for all of them and we follow the material pound for pound to its final resting place. Um, if we don't see control over that material or proof of control, and that's really what we're looking for. I heard somebody say, well, what if the bill of lading is, is forged? We're looking for programmatic control. And you can't fake programmatic control. So programmatic control of all of the material as it moves through the pile and as it goes through transformation into commodity materials or where, wherever it's going, we follow it pound for pound. And when we walk in the door that day, we t announce to them exactly which period we're gonna be tracking. So it's a surprise to everybody what, what quarter of the year is gonna be audited. Um, so that's our downstream channel audits. Very, si yes sir. They're similar, but a little more robust. So they're not R2 specific. So R2 has five, we have eight or nine that we track. Dell.com backslash recycling, environmental partner standards. And actually our dispo, disp, corporate disposition policy, it's only a two page document. The first page is our policy, the second page is definitions. And the definition of what Dell defines as sensitive material is in the definitions on our disposition policy. It's not. Okay. Right. So. So we have a formula for all of our 70 plus partners that it involves mass balancing. We know what went in and we know approximately what should be coming out and they have to prove that through mass balancing. Just to the next year and then they have to go further. And then they have to go, they have to go all the way to the end. Final, final processing position. This chart may not show it all because it gets monotonous after that. 
Yes. For, for sensitive materials. That's part of the mass balancing formula. Yep. All right. So this is the downstream chart. Um, downstream material process flow. Um, and again, functional testing is the key, of course, to all of it. And nobody can functionally test uh, any of the Dell equipment, or nobody can have valid testing of the functional equip of functional non functional equipment, except those of our uh, suppliers or recyclers around the world that actually have a contract with us. Everybody else would be out of compliance because they they haven't been audited, and we don't validate their processes and their rigor. Um, so if they're part of, and we have a whole scorecard within the business, there's 267 material streams within the company. 267 business processes that generate end of life electronics. So break fix, um, lease return, uh, warranty repair. Um, there's 267 of those. And all of the business owners within the company, one level below Michael, own a scorecard on this risk and we report it rigorously and we report it all the way to Michael. Um, here are the numbers from last year, 192 million pounds collected globally. Um, uh, 51 countries, we've just expanded our consumables program, uh, so consumables ink and toner to 51 countries around the world. Um, Increased the free recycling, uh, residential recycling, to 79 countries. And uh, we have a partnership with uh, Goodwill Industries in the US. Um, 117 of the 166 Goodwills around the country uh, partner with us as the exclusive uh, uh, end of life for their residential electronics collections. Um, and that equates to about 2,600 collection points around the country. Um, so that's what we do. Here's my contact information for a short little while. Um, if you have any questions, great. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Mike. All right. So next we are going to go on and talk, uh, from a, a reuse and refurbishment standpoint with certification. Uh, and we've got Willie Cade. He is the founder and chief executive officer for PC Rebuilders and Recyclers, home of the, com home of the Computers for Schools program. Um, he was chosen, or they were chosen by Microsoft as one of the first community Microsoft authorized refurbishers in the US. He's the conference founder and owner of ICRS, the International Computer Refurbisher Summit. He is a R2 stakeholder, he's implemented and it's certified at PCRR. Uh, he's a PACE stakeholder and co-chair of Environmentally Sound Testing, Refurbishment and Repair of Used Computing Equipment for the Partnership for Action on Computing. All right, <laughs> I'm done. Here's Willie. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna stand down here just because I like to move around when I talk. Uh, um, can you do slides for, or I need to. Do you want the clicker? Yeah, I'll take the clicker. Um, I, I have to admit something to you real quickly. These are not my slides. These are one of my very, very good staff people. The president of our company did these slides. So I, these will be a surprise to me too. So, no, I'm just, um, by the way, everyone should get uh, yourself uh, someone who is a lot better than you are at the details. Um, one of the things that we decided to do when we got certified was that we were going to do it fast. We were going to do it well, and we were going to include everybody. Um, and you can imagine, uh, our company's 30 people, you can imagine 30 people, you know, some of them are the, uh, the truck guys, etc. It takes some hurting to get it done. So um, 
Just know that when you get into this particular process, it's going to be very important that you have a champion that's really going to work on the documents, that they're really going to work to make sure it happens. And this particular champion has to have enough chutzpah in the organization that when people say, when you know, the, the R2 uh, compliance meeting is scheduled and everybody goes, oh, R2, they go, no, 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 we're going to do it. Because every time I go through one of those meetings, at the end of the meeting, I am surprised and pleased by at least one result. And I think that's the thing that's probably most important for you to understand about this, this certification R2 Rio's situation is how important, how valuable it is to you on an operational day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to talk about why, what the benefits are, and was it worth the cost. That's my goal in this talk. Um, so for us, we're a refurbisher. We want to get to the equipment. We want to make sure that it's workable at the hardware level and then bring and add a new software load on top of it and maximize the value. For us, we can't get enough equipment. And so we are constantly looking for more and more equipment because what we want to do is make more money, obviously. And the value per pound for refurbished equipment versus equipment that's going to go into someone's shredder is significantly higher. It makes lots of sense, right? Um, so what does R2 Rios give us? It gives us a structure. Now, I like to think that I really cared about my 30 employees why do I need some schmo coming in and telling me that, you know, I need to follow this, I need to do that, and, you know, all of those kinds of things to get the procedures right, if you will, for not only the environment, but also the, the health and safety of my employees. I mean, I know each one of them by name. Um, as a matter of fact, if I walk the floor, uh, I'm often hit up for, hey, Willie, you got five bucks. Uh, I need lunch today. Tomorrow's payday. Yeah, sure. Here you go. You know. So for me, it was like, why do I need to do this? The answer is, once you get in the process, once you start to ask yourself the very specific questions and you get the whole list of them in there, you see things that you had not seen before. It's worth it in that. So um, also, too, is as I'm going in my day-to-day -day interactions and all the things that I think about, it's nice for us once a month to sit down and literally go through the R2 Rios checklist. Do we do this, 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 and this? Most of the times we've done it, but there are some times we forget to do things. So I am thrilled that we, that we use this as a way to uh, work with all of the people and take care of all the people in our company. By the way, my wife um, is uh, the, uh, she, her job is the person to, that is nice to people job, <laughs> right? Um, and, and also my, my, the president of our company, I'm the CEO, the president of the company is my daughter. So we got kind of a family thing going here. So we really like the way that feels in our environment. Um, by the way, the interesting thing for me is, is with this structure, everyone becomes accountable. It's not just, oh, OK, you, you're the boss, or you're the supervisor, or the supervisors are the ones that are responsible. We have an annual meeting uh, that we take off site uh, with our staff around Christmas time. And one of the things that we do is, is we ask them to contribute their thoughts and ideas about improvements. Uh, we've been doing it almost every year uh, for the 13 years that we've been in business. And there's been some magnificent things that have come out of that. 
One of the things that we do, for example, is, is when we refurbish a PC and get it out into our customer's hands, we provide a three-year warranty. Notice three years, that's more than my friend at Dell give on their pieces. We just like to think that our equipment is just well tested when we get it. Kind of. So um, including your staff and making sure that they know and understand the, the particular uh, responsibility that they have, both environmentally and in health and safety, is really, really positive environment. Um, we actually now have some of our staff coming up to us and going, you know, so-and-so's doing the forklift and he's, he looks a little queasy today. And it's like, not the guy who should be on the forklift today. That's great news for me. I'm glad that there's another set of eyes out there that are taking a look at that and making sure uh, that our, our people are safe. Um, also to um, also, too, is our customers. Right now, there's so much misinformation out there in the world about electronics. Do you have to wipe the hard drive seven times? Ten times? Is three good enough? Wait a minute, I thought the Department of Defense said you had to do it three. Oh, wait, there's a new state. So there's some real educational process that needs to happen. When we got certified, that just went away. We said, oh, would you really like to know all of those kinds of details? Here's the R2 standard, knock yourself out. And they went, oh, okay, great. Oh, and by the way, we go through an annual third party audit. So we actually do live to these things. This is not just ideas and goals for people. Um, so, next slide. Currently, this slide says 352 R2 uh, that are R2 certified. I just looked it up uh, about an hour ago and it's 374. Uh, this number was put together less than 30 days ago. So 22 organizations in the, in the last month, the last 30 days or so, have become R2 certified. Uh, so it's not really about beating your competition anymore. It's really about being the competition. You have to be out there. You have to know it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot that aren't certified. Most of the time, though, they're not going to be competing with you for the large loads, the real value loads. Um, and someone back there talked about how they lost a government contract because they didn't have R2 certification. Though that's a situation really tough to get in the midst of. And quite frankly, you don't have to live through that. So um, let's see. For me, absolutely worth the cost day one on what it did for our people, what it did in terms of educating, and what it did for me in terms of peace of mind that my people, I know my people are safe, they are operating within some parameters. They have some good rules to work around. Now, we've also gotten more equipment in. Our customers, people giving us the equipment, are much more satisfied with us in that process. Um, also, too, by the way, uh, from time to time, I don't know, maybe it's happened to some of you people. You have an employee who just wasn't really the greatest employee and you finally found the excuse to get rid of them. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. And then they go and call OSHA. So we moved into our new facility. This was five years ago. We moved into our new facility. The guy calls OSHA because there was dust. I kid you not, dust, you know, paper dust, on the pipes. And he told OSHA that it was asbestos, and that we were exposing our workers to asbestos. I said, really? You guys, oh, I'm sorry, we have to take this seriously. I said, wait a minute, you can look at it and see. It was never wrapped, it was, it was just dust. So no, we have to take it. And we, so they took a sample and they went and they came back and said, yes, it's cellulose. You mean dust? Yes, it's dust. I was like, huh, 
In the meantime, I think there was a pallet that was vertical as opposed to horizontal, so they could charge us. I was like, really? So OSHA, if they want to, they will come in and they will be a real pain in the ass. I had no idea, quite frankly, that OSHA could take and fine you for a pallet that is vertical versus horizontal. One of those kinds of things. So it's worth it. Um, I'm, P I'm Willie Kane from PC Rebuilders and Recyclers. Are there in any questions from the point of view of a refurbisher? Now, by the way, I do use a lot of you guys in terms of downstream, and we do our due diligence with you, et cetera. Are there any questions in the room? Oh, there was a question here earlier about how much did it cost us? We spent about $15,000 to get it done to do the initial certification process. We spent that much money, be only that amount of money with 30 employees, because we had a very uh, tenacious internal staffer who managed the process. We used a consultant, absolutely a must for us, because it was our first time in doing any kind of certification. Um, and I think our annual is around somewhere under $5,000. So for us, very worthwhile costs all the way around. If you, wanna, if you wanna talk afterwards about your specific situation, please feel free to, to ask me. Any questions? Back, far room. Are ink and coders have component of your business model? Are what? Ink and toner cartridges at all part of your operations? We do get ink and toner in, um, and we typically are passing that downstream to our downstream vendors. We're not refilling cartridges, we're not refurbishing at that level. Any other questions? Great, thanks. Okay, so our last presentation today is uh, going to be Julius Hess, and he's going to talk about from a recycler standpoint, um, and then we'll go into an open uh, Q&A panel uh, for you. So Julius is the Vice President of Regency Technologies. He has a master's degree in industrial relations from the University of Minnesota. He had a prior management positions in the Mayo Clinic and General Electric. General Electric. Uh, and he was the founder of Regency Technologies in 1998. Among other responsibilities, he does manage the compliance function. So please welcome Julius. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Um, just to talk a little bit about Regency, we are a uh, and a life recycler. We do refurbish as well. Like many in this industry, there's there's definitely value in that. Uh, we started off as a refurbisher only. Uh, today, we're probably 75, 25%. 75% recycle and a life, 25% refurbished. But I'm gonna talk primarily on the refurbisher side. Uh, Willie did a great job on the recycling side. So, you know, I wanna focus on why did we decide to become re uh, Julius, certified? you're talking about recycling. Yeah, we're good. We're good. We got. It. We got. It. Okay. Yeah. Um, so w why did we decide to become certified? Um, we were in a growth stage. You know, we had three facilities, soon to be moving to five. Um, we, uh, you know, we were looking for a system to move to uh, increase quality and efficiency, uh, to improve environmental results. Uh, to look for health and safety uh, improvements uh, and to help in downstream due diligence and visibility uh, and as a stepping stone to new business. You know, that's why all of us are in this. Um, and this was an opportunity to do that. Uh, the standard was fairly new. I think we were you know, the third or fourth facility to become R2 Rio certified. Uh, and it made one of the first to uh, have multiple certificates, um, multiple sites, I should say. Um, so that was really what was in the back of our mind. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, some of the negatives to avoid, uh, you know, OSHA and EPA issues, but uh, quality and efficiency are very important. 
uh, and the larger and more complicated your organization is, uh, the more important it is. You have, you know, large numbers of employees potentially doing different things. Um, so to have a group of employees all working in, uh, using the same work instructions uh, is important. Uh, reducing errors, uh, having common instructions is just extremely important uh, and a set pattern and way of, of, of doing everything you do. Um, just as, as a few examples, um, we, uh, you know, we set targets and uh, you know, we look for uh, specific sorting. When we're re uh, recycling, when we're uh, doing demanufacture, you know, the last step is the sorting process. So we set targets for, you know, uh, doing the quality of work in recycling and, uh, and uh, the sorting piece. Um, this is an example of what we use for work instructions. Uh, for every one of our processes, and there's a lot on this slide, but I just wanted to show it uh, as an example of the kind of thing that we, that we use. Uh, we want to give our employees instructions on you know, the quality side of what they need to do, uh, the environmental side, and the health and safety side. So from in dock receiving, uh, we need the, our employees to know what to look for. What is a focus material? What are the kinds of things we don't accept? Uh, things like explosives, uh, liquids. You know, this is the first step in the process, and the more of that we can stop on the way in the door, uh, the better results we're gonna have. Um, so, you know, we just try to organize it for employees so that they have one set of instructions and everyone's working off the same page. Whether you're in any of our five facilities, uh, you're working off the same uh, group of work instructions. Um, so that's the blue part. The, the green part is really, you know, what are their basic work instructions? And then in the red area, you see, you know, what are the hazards in each area? You know, if there's a problem, what do you do? If there's a spill, exactly how do you clean that up? You know, what is it? Is it mercury? Is it uh, an unknown liquid? So we have specific cleanup instructions for every area. Um, when we, we also set targets in each area. We set targets for uh, environmental results, quality, productivity, uh, health and safety. Um, for environmental, you know, everyone likes to say we're green and everyone is green. We all want to preserve the environment. That's part of what we do really as a living. We're all proud of that. Uh, but the less we landfill, uh, the more money we make. You know, every, do every pound that goes into a landfill is something that's not getting recycled. And yes, some of what we recycle uh, actually costs money, but mostly it is a positive. So the less we landfill, the better, the better, the better it is, the more money we make. Um, so that's an objective of ours. We measure that every quarter in every facility. We have targets that we try to meet and we look for ways of reducing landfill. Everything from, we get a lot of old console TVs, the ones with the wood around it. We're looking for a source uh, to not landfill that. It's pretty tough. There's a lot of preservatives in that, uh, flame retardants. So how do you handle that? We're looking for solutions to those kinds of problems because the less we landfill, uh, the more we're recycling, better returns. Uh, standardizing battery handling, um, you know, there are different types of batteries. They need to be handled in different ways. Some you need to tape above nine volts. Some, you know, each has its own uh, regulations and ways of shipping. So we set up standardized handling uh, procedures for every type of battery as an example. Same thing for mercury. Um, we use pictures as much as possible. You know, we've got large numbers of employees. You know, we want them to know exactly what to do. We do use temps in some of our processes, so we need to train those fairly quickly. Um, this is an example of pictures we use for mercury uh, handling, uh, removing mercury from certain types of appliances. We handle all kinds of appliances. Um, this happens to be uh, hot water tanks. So we explain to, to employees how to remove mercury from uh, these types of uh, materials. Um, again, we use pictures, uh, do a lot of training, 
you know, first day on the job is often a lot of watching and working with employees. Uh, speaking of getting back to the targets, you know, health and safety, you know, our objective is zero accidents. Everyone says that, you know, we put it out there for all employees, we measure our accidents, we, you know, improve every, every day. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as Willie said, in, a, in an OSHA audit, you know, having records of all the training you've done uh, is absolutely indispensable. You know, we, we've been audited in the past. You know, you never are coming out of those clean because it seems like they don't, they don't get paid if they don't give you some kind of citation, but the reality is having all these records and having uh, an employee health and safety management system is the only way to really respond to a, to a, to a system, to a situation like that. Um, truth is, you have a system, you, it's just a matter of documenting it. Um, there was a lot of discussion during Corey's uh, presentation on downstream due diligence and visibility. Um, that's a very important part of what we do. You know, we are the end of life for most of the material we process and, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time doing due diligence. Um, and, uh, you know, our upstreams are, you know, major Fortune 500 companies and also uh, refurbishers and others in, you know, in this room type uh, environment. And they need to make sure they're, we're handling it correctly too. Um, and honestly, this is a way to protect our, our backside uh, in that, you know, we want to make sure we're sending it to the right recycler. We don't send it to a, a, a site that could be a Surya uh, Superfund site. Um, so all those things, uh, you know, we do protect against. Um, and as has been said in here many times, it's a door opener to new business. And increasingly, if you're not able to prove that you're handling all the materials correctly, uh, and certification is the best way to do that, you're just not even in the game anymore. You know, at least with a with a big Fortune 500 type company, uh, which you know is there's definitely margin there. Um, so you know, you're showing your suppliers that uh, that you have a viable QHS uh, system. Um, it makes it easier on them to do due, due diligence on you um, because you've got an easily auditable system. They know you've been through it before. Uh, just having a third party uh, audit you shows that, you know, you at least hold the, you know, pass a scrub test. Um, and that you present less risk to them. So, you know, that's definitely uh, increasingly uh, without this, you don't get into certain accounts at all. Um, in terms of certification process, um, I think we've talked about this many before. I mean, I could go through this again, uh, but uh, you know, just in terms of preparation time, you know, we didn't use a consultant other than uh, training our internal auditors on how to audit. Uh, but it took us probably a year to, maybe a little over a year to actually prepare for it uh, and uh, and get ready. Uh, we certified one facility, and then within a few months, we certified the other four. So it went pretty fast after the first facility. Um, so I'd say internal audits are definitely a hurdle to get over. And, you know, it's not the kind of thing you can self-train on. I would definitely encourage, you know, getting some kind of uh, formal training on doing internal audits. And there are definitely some uh, good consultants who offer packages, you know, ranging from webinars to coming on site and training. Um, you know, we do use, in, we do use third parties for internal audits even now on site. Uh, downstream due diligence is definitely a hurdle and each year there's more and more emphasis uh, on, on this area and Corey, you know, went to, uh, talked about the, in the new standard, there's even increasing uh, emphasis on due diligence, but you know, the more downstreams you have, the more, challenging it is because you know, your tentacles of downstream just go farther and farther 
the shorter you can make your downstream list, the uh, easier it is to manage and the better you'll be able to manage it. But, you know, especially for the folks materials, there's a lot of emphasis on that and you're protecting yourself by doing those kinds of quality downstreams. Um, keeping the system up to date is imperative because, you know, if you're doing something different than what your policies and procedures say, you know, it'll be, become apparent and you're not doing yourself any good because, you know, people don't know what, what they should be doing. Um, so that, those are just uh, some of our experiences in it. Uh, it's definitely enabled our company to grow uh, in, our, in our areas. Okay, thank you, Julius. We're gonna, I'm just gonna open it up um, okay. for the panel and, and if the rest of the panel wants to come on back up here and you can ask us all questions. We've got about 30 minutes, so does anyone have a question? Who wants to answer? Sure, so you can all hear it. I'll take it. Um, when, the question is, is when are you responsible, at what point do you become responsible for your downstream? Uh, we became responsible for our downstreams in preparation for our first or our initial audit. So we went and did the work necessary to verify what they were doing. We didn't, we didn't um, try to go back any time. So we, we, when we were preparing for the audit is when we did our due diligence downstream. Okay, next question. So it's interesting. Um, Repeat the question. Who do we look at as our peers of, from a Dell's program? Uh, I think he was specifically asking you because you developed the program. Um, so we looked at, so I looked at um, the field and nobody was really doing anything in this space. So we had to build this from dust um, and it was a delicate balance of some best practices in EHS, best practices in logistics regulatory oversight, um, some downstream due diligence that we copied, we'll call it copied from Chumeg, um, from, um, or not copied from Chumeg, but, but followed that loosely, and um, uh, line by line, the Basel Convention. So we really had to go back to the raw materials of, so the industry has been framed. And, and back in 2003-ish, it was framed and the regulations were beginning to look at all of these things. We just put them all in one place. Okay. No, there's not a requirement that all your facilities have to be certified. Um, what is changing is you'll be able to use a multi-site certification moving forward so that one cert certificate would cover all of them. Sure. So, from my experience, and, and Corey can talk, um, you know, it may seem easier to do one certification at a time, um, but then you're going to have two separate management systems, right? So, it, it makes it more difficult to integrate, I think, after the fact. And if you're developing it at the start with both standards in one, then you have the ability to mesh them in as one set of procedures and policies. 
Yeah, you know, they actually tie together pretty nicely. So, um, uh, you know, if you start down the road of one, you're probably going to end up touching the other one pretty hard. So, you, you, and from an a auditor perspective, too, uh, you can save some costs on an integrated audit versus uh, trying to do them separately. And if you're working with a consultant, you'll save costs by integrating it together from the very start as well. Any other questions? Sure. The multi site that you were speaking of, how far down the road do you see that? Or is that available now? The, the multi site, how far down the road? So, or is that available now? It, well, currently with R2 2008, it's not available. But it's not available until you complete one cycle, which is three years. With R2 2013, it looks like it will be available from the beginning. So if you have five sites you want to certify, you know, there, it will require some auditing of each site on the front, but then you go into what, what's called a sampling so that each site is, is audited at least once every three years as part of the process. Go ahead. That, that's when the standard is, should be released probably in beginning of June. Okay, so what I'm getting at is we start this process now to get the information that when we download the all information applicable to get certified that will be by next September. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you want to look forward you know, to 2013. And the, the current draft that's in front of the board is available online. So you can go out and download the R2 2013. No, the R2 standard you can go and get now off the website. The Rio standard, you can go ahead and submit for more information um, and become a member and you can get the Rio standard. Any other questions? One, I am looking at those scores, and uh, you know, I forget off the top of my of my head, but there is a website that Safer I Sys. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, that a lot of us use to help us with that. S A F E R S Y S. And note that when you go to run that report, it only gives you a two-year history. So there is another um, link there. When you click on it, you can actually go and run a three year and it's $20 per report. And that is a stumbling block because a lot of people as they're going through this for the first time, only do the two year, then the auditor mm -hmm. comes in and says, well, where's the third year? And so that, that would be something I got hit for, so <laughs> learn my lesson. It's seepersist.org.com. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So, so as to your question as to what, what's uh, significant, um, yeah, because you could still be a uh, carrier that's operating uh, under DOT records and not an issue, but uh, uh, even if you were probably within the intervention, you're still operating within the set of DOT records. So, yeah. So, we don't accept this right. So the reason why it only says significant is because, you know, we're talking in terms of the U.S. right now. But what about um, ocean freight? What about air freight? What about other countries? Um, so as part of the pr your process, you would have to establish what criteria you're using to evaluate transporters. Uh, in the U.S., I mean, I've used the, the safer information, looking at the um, out of service rate for vehicles, the out of service rate for drivers, and comparing that to the national average. So my criteria was as long as they're below the national average. And I've actually had to disqualify some, 
some transporters because they were above it. Um, uh, you, you know, that's, that's what I would look at. Any other questions? And that is a good point because a lot of the templates that Rios provides or a consultant might provide for you to, to help you get going, and even looking at the safer sets and the, the word significant is to make this your own. It's your company, you're the ones that are going through it. So even though you're given some guidance in some area, you want to make it your own project. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, great. I just want to remind everybody to complete your evaluation forms and if you can leave them at the back of the room, we really appreciate the feedback. There are a lot of good sessions over the next few days for the electronics uh, as well as scrap recycling industry, so enjoy. Thank you.